So it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Christian Knobla, uh, who has been a lecturer in Egyptian material culture at Swansea University since 2018. He came the long route via Sydney, Berlin, Sydney again, Melbourne and Vienna. His research interests can be loosely described as Egyptian and Nubian archaeology and material culture. He works at Abydos and he co-directs the Oranati Regional Archaeological Project in Sudan. And it's, uh, like I say, usually um, on, a, on a Friday evening like tonight, Christian and I would have a nice, uh, a nice beer or two in the, uh, the student union bar. But unfortunately, because of the lockdown, we can't do that. So we just have to do it virtually instead. So cheers, Christian, and uh, over to you. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Ken, just before we start, can you see my video? Yeah, we can see we can see you, Christian, and we can see your slides. Oh, great! Uh, how Sorry, long I have have you muted, muted myself. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all working. We can see you on the slides. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Christian. I lecture at Swansea University. What I was hoping to do tonight is to give you a, a little bit of a taste of what it's, I guess, like to be a Swansea University student. Um, and this, what I'm going to be presenting tonight is based on uh, one of the courses which I teach, which is Egyptian art and architecture. Um, and in this course, we're hugely lucky to be able to go into the Egypt Centre a lot. And I like to confront students with objects that they've never seen before um, and through teamwork and knowledge they've acquired through readings and also lectures before the session in the Egypt Centre, students then try and work out uh, the date and the meaning of um, objects that they're um, confronted with. I'm going to talk tonight about one particular object which gave all of us, including uh, me, quite a bit of trouble. And I ended up giving a short lecture um, to the class about this object afterwards. And that's essentially what this lecture is tonight. Um, I should probably preface uh, this lecture by saying that um, it's great working with museum objects and um, we at, in Swansea, and we certainly do welcome unique objects as long as we know from where they come from. So as long as we've got some idea about a context. Um, on the other hand, if an object has no known context, um, we would really prefer them often to be ordinary and have lots of parallels, thereby establishing the authenticity. So full disclosure tonight, uh, the object I'm going to be talking about is fairly unique and also has no provenance whatsoever. I'll just see if I can shift slides. Okay, this is object uh, Egypt Center W415 without provenance. It was bought by Henry Welcome in the 1906 Robert de, uh, de Rastafiel sale at Sotheby's, where there was actually a number of questionable pieces under the hammer, as you might have heard in some of the earlier lectures. The only documentation for this is an appropriately cautious modes entry in the online catalogue, where the pot is linked with the late prehistoric period, but with for fully understandable reasons, doubt is expressed as to whether the object is in fact Egyptian, due to the lack of narrow, known parallels. And I should say that this scepticism, it might be added, is shared by a number of specialists in Egyptian art with whom I've discussed the piece. One of them, who shall not be named, said to me, it looks dodgy as if it's been tarted up for sale. Sorry, I'm just having a bit of problem shifting slides. Indeed, one possibility uh, for W415 is that it is a modern forgery uh, created at the end of the 19th century, along with a number of other deware or so called decorated fakes now in English collections. These were identified by a combination of stylistic analysis as well as therm thermoluminescence dating in the article which I've given you a reference to at the bottom of the screen. Interestingly, the authors of this study, I quote, argued that the pots in question are genuine 
but the decoration was added in modern times, at which times the vessels were then refired. This elaborate procedure quite obviously was to increase the selling price of plain Egyptian prehistoric pots on the antiquities market, because there was a real glut of these, this type of pottery on the, um, on the market in the late 19th century, partially due to the excavation of large cemeteries um, around Nagada, Diospolis Parva, and other sites in Upper Egypt. What I'd like to kind of show tonight is that I think not only is the pot in the Egypt Centre actually certainly genuine, but the decoration is probably genuine too. And it quite clearly stands between two artistic traditions, which makes it fairly difficult, uh, I guess, to place. So I'm gonna go through four different points. First of all, I'm going to discuss the date, the probable production context, and I'm gonna try and place the vessel in a prehistoric tradition. In the middle part of the lecture, I'm going to then look at um, trying to identify different elements of the scene, reconstruct the entire scene, and also then offer an interpretation, highly speculative, of course, of its iconography. And then finally, I'm gonna come back to the vessel itself um, and consider its materiality and look at the possible functions of the vessel in question. So let's start with identifying traditions and also uh, dating the vessel. Well, first of all, let's get some basic parameters um, uh, correct. The vessel is 22 centimeters in height. It's made of Egyptian Nile silt with limestone, which doesn't sound like an exciting point to make, but will become quite important later on. It's handmade from coil, from coils, so without any wheel assistance, which fits a prehistoric date absolutely perfect. The shape can be described as barrel shaped. And the decoration, which you can see here, is a decoration in red brown paint um, on a plain orange to red surface. Importantly, I should tell you what you're looking at here. You're looking down on the top of the vessel from a bird's eye perspective. Importantly, just below the rim, um, we can see that there's an internal ledge, um, obviously for the reception of a lid. And then there are four pierced holes. These were made pre-firing and were possibly for the attachment of a lid or what I think is more likely for uh, suspending the vessel and uh, hanging it. The decoration is certainly the most eye-catching element of the pot. Um, the pot divide, the decoration is divided into three main areas. At the top, first we have a band of triangles. Most of these are with a solid fill, but then there are four um, unfilled triangles, which we just have an outline for. Below this, we have a horizontal band, which is filled with uh, crisscross or lattice work uh, lines. And at the bottom of the, in the bottom of the space, we have a series of four animals, all facing our right, with each standing on its own register line. One curious little uh, tidbit, which I honestly don't know what to do with, is that the heads of the animals seem to line up with the empty uh, triangles. This is only one of the animals that you've seen. In fact, there are four different animals um, in, uh, around the circumference of the vessel and their identification which I'm going to get onto a little bit later on, leaves very little doubt about the Egyptian prehistoric nature of the motif, but more on this later. Uh, yes, somebody raised their hand. Is there a problem? I'll continue. As pointed out by the modes cataloger, neither the fabric of the vessel, nor the shape, the morphology, or the surface color, or even the style of the painting, 
fit very easily within the popular perception of so-called D-wear or decorated wear. Now, this is a type of prehistoric Egyptian pottery that was defined by William Matthew Flinders Petrie in the late 19th century, following on from his excavations in the cemetery of Nagada and Diospolis Parva, and it's part of his famous sequence dating exercise. Um, the common perception of this ware is based on vessels made of a very distinctive buff coloured light pink marl clay with red brown decoration, such as this wonderful example that we have in the Egypt Center collection in Swansea. A lot of them show animal processions, but also some of them, for example, um, this one shows uh, a boat boating procession um, where the boats have this wonderful shape of a Vienna sausage. Most of these vessels then have a closed shape and most have uh, two handles, possibly also for suspension. This definition of or classic definition of uh, D-ware is reinforced uh, by the popularity and prevalence of classic D-ware in both the original Petri publications as well as in modern museums. Almost without exception, all these date to late in the so-called Nagada II period of Egyptian prehistory. So uh, in the second half of the fourth millennium BCE. This definition of D-ware, however, I would argue is, is quite limited and it's um, an oversimplification. And it results, of course, from an imperfect understanding of the original scheme as divine, designed by Petrie. We actually know that Petrie's decorated ware, in fact, includes a much wider range of vessel shapes, fabrics and decoration types than the classic D-ware, a fact for which Petrie, of course, has been criticised as it undermines his concept of what actually constituted a ware within his system. In fact, this wider corpus of lesser well-known D-ware includes a number of vessels of roughly the same shape and ware as vessel, uh, Swansea Vessel 415. All of the sh vessels shown here share the same barrel shape as the vessel from Swansea. And although this is not always indicated on these old drawings, they all have the internal gutter rim ledge with four incised holes for fastening of a lid or possibly for suspension. Importantly, all have red painted decoration on a buff to orange background. We can notice, however, and this is something that's interesting, is the decorative tradition of these jars is very heterogeneous and it's idiosyncratic in comparison to the standardized classic D-ware, which I showed you on the previous two slides. Possibly some of the decoration imitate, imitates basketry or vessels made in other materials. And I think this is probably also an, an important point to make. As can be seen from the proverb, pro provenience in bold type, all come from tomb contexts and from southern Egypt as well as northern Nubia, starting essentially in the area of Kaw el Kabir and reaching upstream to Medik, um, suggesting this is a local tradition of Upper Egypt, something that we don't necessarily know from Upper Lower Egypt from the decorational perspective. However, and I'd like to thank Stan Hendricks for giving me a steer towards this vessel. The vessel that comes closest to the Swansea jar in terms of both shape, but also decoration, albeit without the animals, is an unpublished vessel from George Reisner's very little known excavations at El Ahaiwa. Now, this was a large late pre-dynastic cemetery to the south of Abydos that was excavated in 1900 to 1901. The vessel is now in the Phoebe Hearst Museum in Berkeley, and it has both the triangles around the vessel neck, um, as well as the latticework decoration on the shoulder and belly of the, um, the vessel as similar to the Swansea vessel. As can be seen from the image on the right, it also has the same gutter rim with the four pierced holes as W415. I think this is essentially the closest I can get in terms of a parallel 
for our Swansea vessel. Um, two features which they had in common, of course, was the use of joint triangles and bands of lattice work. Um, these obviously can be directly related to the decoration of classic D-ware um, that dates to the so-called Nagata II period, examples of which are shown on this particular slide. Although we have to say that the design and the layout, as well as the execution of both the vessels I just showed you, is quite different from the two barrel shaped vessels being discussed here. I suspect that the reason for this difference is because of a difference in date. And let's start with the Alakaiwa vessel. It comes from Cemetery 500, Tomb 243, uh, for which, in addition to the vessel which I just showed you, there were three additional objects. Of these, the shoulder jar in the bottom left of this screen is probably the most useful for chronological purposes. I can't, for example, date a polishing stone. Um, but it does suggest a date for this tomb in the Nagata 3P. 3B period, or so-called Dynasty Zero, so sometime after Nagata II, when the classic D-ware dates. A similar date is also suggested by the circular-shaped palette, which we can see in the top right-hand of the screen. Although we have no evidence for the remainder of the context, or do we have any information about the state of the tomb when it was discovered. I think all the evidence we do have suggests a date for this vessel a considerable time after the beginning of the Nagata III period, and thus perhaps a, at least a century after the heyday of the classic D-ware. Now, such a date for the Swansea vessel is compatible with Hendrix's 2002 study of barrel-shaped vessels throughout Egypt Nubia and the Levant. As he could show, barrel-shaped vessels first occurred during the Nagata I phase, in the, uh, phase and were in use then continuously until the end of the Nagata period, which is at the end of Dynasty II. How however, those which we can see were decorated in a tradition related to Petrie's D-ware, these are amongst all the latest examples of this vessel shape, and they can be dated by context to roughly contemporary with Dynasty Zero and Dynasty One, or rather, let's say Nagata 3B through to Nagata 3C1. I think together this strongly suggests that the Swansea vessel probably should also date to this later period and not before. In fact, what I'm going to suggest is that this later dating for W415 is in fact compatible with certain features we can see in the decoration, namely the technique of the brushwork, which has very little in common with that of D-ware and instead reminds us more strongly of figural art as well as ink inscriptions of the proto-dynastic and early dynastic periods. The use of drawn baselines on the Swansea vessel for the animals is also quite unlike classic D-ware and instead seems to find parallels in the first use of baselines for individual figures, so these are lines on which figures are standing, in the art of Dynasty Zero and early Dynasty One. For example, on the Nama palette, famous Nama palette of late Dynasty Zero or early Dynasty One, where the sandal bearer standing behind the king is positioned on such a baseline. While certainly extremely uncommon in Nagata III, the depiction of groups of animals in combination with triangles, latticework, decoration, and um, is something that was extremely common, obviously, in the preceding Nagata II period. As such, I think the Swansea vessel is perhaps best understood as at the very, very end of a long tradition that had lasted over half a millennium. So rather than a, an outlier, it's essentially the last of its kind. 
It combined archaic motives, motifs, along with contemporary style, artistic canon, as well as we'll see some new ideas and concepts. So, having established what I personally think are reasonable proofs of the authenticity of the pot and its existence in an identifiable ceramics tradition, I would now like to make some comments regarding the decoration, starting with the identification of the individual icons first, pardon me, before going um, on to a reconstruction of the scene. I'm just going to have a glass of water. So, what we experienced as a class when we looked at these objects was that it was quite difficult to see what was depicted on the uh, pots with the naked eye. But using a colour enhancer such as D-Stretch, I've given you the email address um, for the plugin here. It was developed for using uh, for uh, for working with rock art. We can actually uh, get a much clearer idea of what's actually represented on the vessels. And I'm going to go through the four different animals now and discuss what I personally think they are. So the first is what I think is probably an ibex, uh, probably the Nubian ibex, which is a uh, 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 from the genus Capra and the family Bovidae, um, it's a it's a it's a um, it's a uh, Capra which is about sixty five to seventy five centimeters high. Characteristically, it has very strong incurved horns that in males can grow up to about 1.2 meters in length. So I'm presuming the example that we've got here on our uh, pot here is in fact a male. Note how you can probably see this, that the artist has managed to capture the distinctive fluting or the annual rings on the horns, um, as well as the long uh, goatee beard um, underneath the chin. Now, the habitat of the ibex today includes Egypt, uh, predominantly only to the east of the Nile River, and particularly in the mountainous regions of the Red Sea um, hills. Beyond here, it also occurs in the Sinai, Eastern Sudan, Eritrea, as well as parts of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, importantly, bones of um, Caprex ibex nubiana um, occur in uh, bone assemblages uh, prehistoric, in prehistoric Egypt, albeit in fairly low numbers, indicating that it was hunted, but not necessarily in high, um, high uh, volume as others. Um, it also occurs regularly on prehistoric uh, pottery, is represented regularly on prehistoric pottery. And according to the thesis of Guinola Graf, it uh, occurs 44 times and makes up 36% of the Bovideas represented on prehistoric art. The second example, I'll just let you dwell on it for one second before I give you what I think is my solution. I think this is essentially um, a Dorcas gazelle, which is a small gazelle with very distinctive lyre-shaped horns that are clearly visible um, in the Swansea vessel. These animals are generally <clears throat> brown coloured with light flanking stripes. Um, and you can see how the artist here has captured um, the, uh, the stroke, uh, the stripe on the uh, flank with a single uh, brush stroke. The artist has chosen interestingly to depict the gazelle with its tail in a vertical position. Now, uh, I know very little about animal behavior, but I tried to do a little bit of research in preparation for this, uh, for this uh, paper. Perhaps somebody out there knows it better than I. Um, anyway, this seems to be unusual behavior for an adult gazelle at rest or in any kind of normal social situation. Rather, it seems to be an indication of high stress situations, essentially when the gazelle is about to take flight. 
Uh, like the ibex, this is of course a desert animal um, in, indigenous in the Red Sea Hills. It's represented on a number of other objects of the Nagata II and Nagata III periods. And amongst wild animals, it is the most frequently hunted. Um, so we have the highest density of bones from the Dorcas gazelle occurring um, in zoo, zoo archaeological um, assemblages in pre-dynastic Egypt from the Nagata II period onwards. Uh, this animal, um, I think, is, is quite problematic. Um, however we interpret it, it's very unique. Now, um, in my family, we've discussed these animals quite a bit because I've got two children who like animals. And my seven-year-old son, um, who likes cute animals especially, he thinks that this is a fennec fox. And this is a very small fox found in the eastern and western deserts of Egypt that's also occasionally shown in prehistoric white cross-lined wear, um, an example of which you can see on the left. And these are hunting dogs. And then here we would have uh, the example um, of uh, Fenicus zerda. I was also uh, given a steer by a colleague that we might also be looking at a uh, representation of an African wild ass, Equus africanus, um, representations of which occur frequently in rock art in both the eastern and western deserts. Um, this is an example on the left, which we can see from El Cab. It's very seldom represented on pottery. There's only one published example, or there's an unpublished example from a black topped vessel. Um, most of these representations of Equus africanus have in common a stroke uh, at the neck, which is, I think, highlighted with a yellow circle here. And Hoig has argued that these strokes indicate a projectile or a knife. And the meaning of this icon is the symbolic suppression of negative forces personified in these animals. Um, and uh, we can notice that on this vessel there is some kind of a discoloration um, behind the head or neck of the animal. Uh, my personal preference, um, and this is what I'm going to be arguing, is that it looks essentially like a cape hair, Lapis uh, capensis. This is a large brown hare with powerful hind legs that like the previous two also inhabited the desert edge of Egypt. It's best known from the hieroglyph for Wen, which you can see on the bottom left hand of this screen. Um, and interestingly, it's the second most hunted animal in pre-dynastic Egypt. So it is uh, uh, an animal which there would have been fairly regular contact with in human context. Admittedly, although it occurs quite often in um, faunal uh, assemblages, it has to be said that the Cape Hare was not a very popular artist subject in prehistoric and early dynastic art, but it does occur on, I would argue, the roughly contemporary so-called hunter's palette, um, which I've circled, I've circled the hare in yellow. Um, where we can see a whole host of desert as well as uh, uh, animals being hunted. So I'm going with the identification of this little vessel as a uh, little, I, I'm not obsessed with pottery, uh, I just said vessel, but I meant obviously animal um, here. But I'm of course interested to know what you think. So this will be one of the questions uh, of the quiz. Now this animal the fourth animal, it's not obvious when you first look at it, but in my opinion, I think it can probably only be one thing, a boss taurus taurus, probably a domesticated bull, um, although the frequently hunted wild oryx or heart beast probably can't be ruled out either. I'd suggest that the strange depiction here um, is essentially an attempt by the artist to depict the top bull in a very uh, aggressive pose. And you could say, you could, uh, we can argue that this mode of representation also con corresponds to the way that aggressive bulls would uh, 
uh, represented um, in the late prehistoric and early dynastic period. For example, on this example from the famous Nama palette, which I've already referred to um, uh, earlier. So, of our four animals, we can say that three of these are from the desert, indicating that what we have is essentially a scene of the desert. The odd one out, or possibly not, is a bull. Now, despite the very wild nature of these animals and the very rugged nature of the environment that they inhabited, we can also see that the animals are essentially forced into a single line, or what is sometimes called by prehistorians as an animal procession, which of course is lent emphasis by the use of register lines for all the animals. Tentatively, I'd also go as far as to suggest that at least one of these animals, the gazelle, but possibly also the ibex, looking at its very upright pose, is in a state of alertness or alarm. When considering the aggressive behavior of the bull between them, I would say that this type of behavior, of course, is entirely understandable. Now, let's move on towards trying to interpret the scene. Is this just a scene showing someone's favorite animals? Does the scene have to be interpreted at all? Of course not. And we all know that it must be extremely difficult to crawl into the minds of people who were living upwards of 5,000 years ago, before the birth of the Egyptian state even. But I think we can go a little further, albeit cautiously. I think we have to start by asking ourselves, what role did these desert animals and desert animals generally have in prehistoric Egypt? And what was their relationship uh, to humans. Well, while I earlier stressed that these animals were hunted in prehistoric Egypt, this has to be essentially be, to be put in proper context. Now, since the Neolithic period, so from the um, end of the 6th century to the um, middle of the 5th uh, millennium BC, human beings living in the Nile Valley are no longer reliant on hunting. Rather, there's a reliance on animal husbandry, of domesticated animals, as well as in fishing. Desert animals play almost no role in the diet of ancient Egyptians from the Nagata period, uh, from the Nagata II period onwards. In fact, a recent study by Linzela van Meer and Friedman from 2009 found that desert animals, in fact, make up less than 1% of all animal remains from all Nagata II sites, although this did vary uh, regionally. Um, so we can say that these animals, although they are hunted, have very little economic importance for the flood-dwelling population. And if we imagine that the great majority of the Egyptian population were living on tells and settlements in the flood plain, they essentially would have to have very little or almost no contact and personal experience with these types of animals. The one area of human life where desert animals and wild animals more broadly appear to play a very significant role is in the arena of ritual, which is focused on the gods and especially the ruling of elite of late prehistoric and early proto dynastic society. For example, at the site of Hierocompolis, we can notice that there is a much higher than average concentration of wild animal remains in context of a very clearly ritual nature. For example, in the religious precinct HK29 where wild animals appear to have been sacrificed as part of rituals, possibly of rulership. An act that is perhaps alluded to on the so-called Nama mace head, which I've shown, given you a line drawing off in the top of this slide, where we see the king on a dais with steps leading up to it. And in front of him, there are a number of offerings and uh, divine standards being brought. We have the representation of a shrine here. Um, 
the king is identifiable by the serich above him, and we have then retainers and a sandal bearer uh, behind him. And amongst the activities in front of him, we have an enclosure in which there are two bulls. And then here we have another walled enclosure um, where there are then uh, Dorcas gazelles, one of the animals on uh, represented on the pot which I showed you. Um, this suggests that wild animals were hunted but brought back living to the settlement where they were then slaughtered possibly as uh, part of royal festivals. In addition to the use of these animals in royal festivals, we also have the deliberate intentional burial of wild animals in the burial complexes of earlier rulers. For example, in Cemetery um, HK6, where the royal uh, early ruler burials are then surrounded by whole menageries of wild animals, including elephants, lions, hippos, um, uh, uh, and other animals uh, such as uh, dogs. Um, it seems that the animals uh, were possibly brought in captivity, raised in captivity, and then slaughtered um, as part of the funeral uh, procession or part of the funeral proceedings and buried around uh, the, the tombs of the rulers. It's the association between elite behavior and wild animals then. Given this, it's hardly surprising that animals um, in prehistoric art are frequently associated with so-called power facts, objects that essentially relate the ideological basis of human rulership. These objects are made by specialist craftsmen to be used by and for the benefit of the elite of society. For example, this ivory knife handle, but other examples, for example, other examples of power facts would be things such as uh, decorated ivory palette, uh, stone palettes. The theme of these power, fa power facts, according to John Baines and Barry Kemp, is probably similar to the, uh, the meaning behind the burial of slaughtered animals around the tombs of rulers at Hierocompolis, namely the control over unrule. Unrule is controlled in a number of different ways. First of all, the animals, these wild animals, um, are controlled by the use of invisible registers, which basically force these disorderly desert animals into a single balanced line. And secondly, they're then controlled by symbols and animals, so-called controlling animals, often, for example, dogs and lions. On the Davis Comb in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, for example, we can see on the left-hand side here, a row of lions being controlled by a small hunting dog. You can probably see where I'm going with this. One of the uh, typical uh, controlling animals of the late prehistoric and early dynastic period, of course, is the bull. The bull as a controlling animal uh, finds one of its very earliest expressions on this wonderful painted Nagata II vessel from Abydos. We can see it on the bottom half of the vessel where it's uh, combined with uh, representations of hippopotami and then two figures who are hunting the hippopotami which are then shown restrained with ropes. As opposed to the hippopotami, the bull stands free. And an analysis of this seen by Rita Hartman recently shows that the bull in fact was the first element uh, painted and seems to be at the front of the scene. And rather being a subject of the hunt, it seems to preside over the hunt. The hunt in the bottom of the register, of course, parallels the domination of bound humans in the top, um, in the top part of this vessel, where we see a large figure with a mace head, um, then with two smaller figures, uh, possibly with their arms tied behind their back, tied to him. This suggests that the bottom half of the scene is essentially a 
new way of representation, representing what's happening in the top half of the scene, reinforcing, I guess, the allegorical or symbolic nature of these hunting scenes relating uh, to the uh, mastery of humankind over nature. Moving forward in time to the Nagata III period, so getting closer to the period of state formation, the symbol or icon of the aggressive bull was relatively common, not just with animals, but in scenes of domination or mastery over a subjugated human enemy. For example, on the bull's palette, which is now in the Louvre in Paris. Most famously, of course, and I've shown you this example already, it occurs on the Nama palette that dates to the end of Dynasty Zero or early Dynasty One. In the lower part of this uh, monumental stone palette from Hierocompolis, we have a bull standing on its own baseline uh, and it's represented as charging and destroying a walled enclosure and trampling a defeated enemy. On these on this last ex on this example and the one before, the bull doesn't seem to be simply an allegory of human power of chaos, but it seems also to have become a direct symbol of the ruler that effectively communicates the ideological underpinnings of the Egyptian rulership, essentially the birth of the Egyptian state. And of course, we know that going on uh, the identification of the pharaoh uh, with the bull uh, is something that becomes um, standardized. So given the regular use of the icon of the aggressive bull around the time when the Swansea vessel was decorated, I'm strongly inclined to interpret the scene not simply as a procession of placid animals, but a scene ripe with action as an aggressive bull dominating three desert animals. I think the symbolic importance of this is uh, possibly that it relates, like these other objects we've been discussing, to the control of unrule and essentially communicates some of the ideological underpinnings of the ruling elite of early Egypt. Now, coming back to the vessel itself, um, uh, we obviously want to know who used it and what was the vessel actually used for. I think it's obvious that there are many more questions than answers here, and the truth is we'll never know. But it's fun to think about it, and to be honest, I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of us are interested in Egyptology. Of course, as the context of this vessel is unknown and context is critical for understanding the social status and also the function of objects that we find, um, as this is unknown, um, we're going to have more questions than answers. The first question um, that I would put out there is, does the decoration uh, indicate that the vessel was used in rituals? Certainly similar motifs of uh, control over unrule do occur on so-called power facts, which are often found in the context of early shrines, for example, in the main deposit at Hierocompolis. Interestingly enough, we do have models of barrel-shaped vessels, uh, miniature ve versions of these vessels found in early dynastic shrines, indicating that vessels with this shape may have been used in early uh, in early rituals. So this would be one possibility. What does the function actually tell us? Does function in this case follow form? Stan Hendricks and others have suggested that these types of vessels were food jars. Does the representation on the outside of the vessel somehow relate to the type of food that was carried in these jars? Or is the vessel shape completely irrelevant? Was the vessel just suitable for painting on and was simply to hand and was used therefore? Another option that we might also think, and here we have to be wary of teleological thinking, that means using uh, subsequent concepts that we know from Pharaonic Egypt for interpreting prehistoric Egypt. 
could the vessel have been from a grave context? We certainly have a lot of decorated vessels with these types of uh, representations, nothing directly identical, however, during the Nagata II period. So could we be seeing here a continuation of Nagata II burial practices, where objects with these uh, potent symbolism are then buried with the dead? then we have to ask what was the purpose of the symbolism in this case? What was its meaning? Did it also then refer to rule over unrule? Was this somehow equivalent to overcoming death? Was this perhaps a cheap or an alternative version or equivalent to the burial of actual wild animals in the funerary complexes of elite in Nagata too. Now, you could possibly come up with many more questions. I think, uh, and, and other possible interpretations. And that's part of the quiz that you'll see after this. So um, in summary, I think the decoration in the lower half of the vessel is completely unique for a pottery vessel of this area. How, of this era. However, I think the individual icons and the motive accurately reflect contemporary decorative ideas and concepts, while the technique and style corresponds to contemporary practice. This suggests, to me at least, that I think we can make a fairly good case for its genuine nature and its provenance probably with a master painter or an artist. I think if this is the case, then we are extremely lucky to have such an important and unique vessel in Sw Swansea that so clearly stands at the end of one tradition and the beginning of another. Before I finish, I'd like to first of all thank Ken uh, for organising this wonderful series. Uh, the Egypt Centre does so much good for Swansea and Swansea school children um, and for um, communicating the importance of Egyptological study in Swansea. So it's wonderful that you're doing this, Ken, and please do support the Egypt Centre. We also have an Egyptology department at Swansea where you can do a single honours um, or a joint honours. You can also do a master's program or a PhD. If you're interested in finding more about Egyptology at Swansea, please uh, have a look at some of these links. They were hyperlinks, but I these are hyperlinks um, and of course you could have clicked on these images, the logos and got there eventually, uh, but you can't get there. We also, I'd like to plug our object and landscaped approaches to the past research group, uh, which I co-direct with my uh, colleague, uh, Ersan Hussein. We have a YouTube video up, which explains a little bit about what we've been doing this last year. And we also have a web page, which you uh, uh, welcome to visit. And finally, but not uh, uh, finally, I'd like to uh, recommend to you please do check out the blog uh, for our field work project, which we run in the Sudan, uh, the Urinati Regional Archaeological Project, which I run with Laurel Bestock from Brown University. I look forward to your questions, um, and Ken, it's back to you.